Martin who served. Thank you so much, TJ. Good morning, Board of Commissioners and the citizens of Douglas County. I will call this September 14, 2020 virtual work session to order. Um, and good morning again. Lisa, clerk, do we have anyone for public comment this morning? Yes, ma'am. We have two citizens that signed up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you could proceed with the, the instructions and bring the citizens forth, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, first, we ask that you mute your phones and your video um, until you're called on to speak. Uh, once you're called on to speak, if you could uh, give your name and address for the record, and then uh, your three minutes will begin. Once you reach your three minutes, I will uh, let you know that your time is up and you'll need to wrap up your comments. So once public comment is over, you are welcome to remain on the meeting, but just remember to keep your phones um, and video muted. Okay, the first citizen that signed up is Ms. Sharon Bachtel. Ms. Bachtel, are you on the line? Hello, yes, I'm here. Okay, you can go ahead and start. Okay, this is Sharon Bachtel. 6331 South Skyline Drive. Um, I wanted to speak about the fire department furloughs and spending money wisely. How can you be saving money by paying manda mandated overtime to cover regular salaried shifts of firemen who are put on furlough? In December, a commissioner stated that she wanted her part-time aide to have a livable wage of 40000 for a part-time work. Meanwhile, the firemen and the EMTs are offered less than 40000 for full-time work. Do you consider that a livable wage? No wonder the fire department is shorthanded. By closing down the fire stations on certain days, you are putting the citizens in jeopardy and causing their insurance to go up because of decreased, decreased service. Don't furlough our safety personnel. Since you are raising my taxes 27%, I have to watch my pennies. I think you should watch our pennies too. I looked at a commissioner's expense report for transportation. I thought we weren't supposed to be encouraging crowds. Why is it that the commissioners are afraid to meet at the courthouse but are okay with going to listening posts? I also would like to know if you are going to have the $900,000 that the health department needs to get ready for the vaccine in November. After all, one commissioner did say in the December BOC meeting, we have plenty of money for any disaster. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bachtel. Um, we have one other citizen that signed up, Ms. Triana James. Ms. James, are you on the line? She may have had trouble signing, um, accessing the meeting. Chairman, she must not be on the line. Thank you so much. We're going to move on. Um, certainly, I want to call roll before we move forward. Uh, I'll start with District 1 Commissioner Henry Mitchell III. Are you available? Are you present? Yes, I'm here. Okay, District 2 Commissioner um, Kelly Robinson. Present. District 3 Commissioner Terenia Carthen. Present. District 4 Commissioner Ann Guider. Present. Okay, thank you so much, Board of Commissioners. Uh, we will start, and certainly I'm just going to move around the agenda a little bit as we move quickly uh, through our agenda today. It's, it seems like it's not that robust, but certainly want to be I'm very sensitive to uh, the Board of Commissioners' times and also to our citizens' time. Approval of the minutes, uh, Board of Commissioners, I encourage you in this tab one through four to take a look at the minutes tomorrow and be prepared to approve accordingly. And then also Board of Commissioners tab five and six, we have proclamations. Uh, tab number five is proclaiming September 22nd, 2020 is National American Business Women's Day in Douglas County. I ask you to bring your listening ears and be prepared to approve or deny accordingly. Tab number six, celebrating Georgia Highlands uh, College 50th 
50th anniversary. So we're excited about that tomorrow as well. So please, uh, that, that will be another proc uh, proclamation presented. So please bring your listening ears and be uh, uh, prepared to approve or deny accordingly. And then Board of Commissioners tab number 16 and 17 is approval of expenses. Please, uh, I ask you to look at these expenses and be prepared to approve accordingly tomorrow. With that being said, I will uh, pivot back to our presentation. We have a presentation this morning. It's a splashed update from Mr. Terry Gable. And Mr. Gable, uh, if you're here, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, uh, members morning. of the board. My name is Terry Gable, and I'll be doing a, a quick uh, splashed update for uh, the month of September, if we're ready. Um, I'll share the um, the PowerPoint that I, I've got uh, prepared here. Uh, let's see here. Okay, um, so this is uh, the report for the month of September, and I'll be reporting on the July revenues and the work that we have accomplished through August. Uh, we invoiced out about $3 million for the month of August, so a pretty uh, robust month for us as far as uh, work completed. Um, hang on just a second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so for the uh, the totals for the for the program, we have uh, invoiced out about forty six point six million dollars, and as I said, that that was an increase of about three million dollars um, uh, for the overall program. We invoiced out about six hundred sixty thousand dollars in fire and EMS for the month. It brings us up to twenty one point two million. Uh, for transportation, uh, we invoiced out about $385,000 and we're approaching the $50 million, $15 million mark with transportation. And finally, with uh, with Parks and Rec, uh, we invoiced out close to $2 million for recs. A lot, of, a lot of work going on with the verticals um, and got some great things uh, nearing completion. So uh, about $8 million there. So with that, with the with those uh, totals and the amount invoiced out, go through the revenues real quick. Um, so we've we've had another uh, another good month in July. Um, pleased to see that we're about three hundred thousand dollars over uh, projection. Again, uh, the revenues total about nine million dollars for the splash year four, uh, and we're like I said, we're in the um, month of July. So the, uh, the revenues over projections are right at $800,000 over. If you just look at the revenues we received in year four, about $800,000 over. Uh, and looking at the bar graph, um, so you can tell we've done very good, uh, fortunately, with the SPLOS revenues uh, since uh, since April. That, that April, uh, the month of April was right at projections. Um, and as we moved into um, May and June, um, expecting some uh, some um, reduction in revenues, but things are just held well. Uh, my fact, I think through the whole program, we haven't seen a um, a steady um, uh, income of revenues coming in like we've had May, June, and July. So good news there. It just helps us overall in the program, and I'm uh, very thankful for that. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, citizens be able to continue to spend the money where we're where it seems to be helping the most. So um, with that and looking at the overall program in years one, two, three, and four, that brings us to a grand total of $84.8 million uh, that we've collected up to this day. Uh, that compared to the overall projections is 80.8 80, 80 .8 million dollars. And we're just climbed over the $4 million mark with our, um, um, the amount over what was projected uh, initially in the, at the beginning of the program. So in looking at real quick, the bond service and the payment obligations, uh, we're, the first payment's right around the corner, uh, October 1st. We'll make that smaller payment of 509, and then April 1st of 2021 is when the, the, the larger payment will be made. 
which will bring us up to a total for this year of $17.3 million uh, paid out for the bond obligation. So um, we'll take care of, get that taken care of. And with that, that's an update on our revenues. Again, um, good report. Uh, keep our, our fingers crossed again, and hopefully the, the revenues will, will continue to stay up uh, with the pandemic. Uh, just some, we'll start with fire and EMS. Uh, our ambulance was uh, advertised and bid out uh, this past month. It's been reviewed by the committee and um, we had three bids come in and the, um, the bid, one of the bid awards is on the agenda today for approval. Uh, Custom works and we look forward to that and getting that ambulance in production uh, and moving forward with it. It does take a little bit of time to get them in. So we look forward to getting that one approved. Um, also on our fire truck, this one has already been approved as you, we, we've been reporting. Uh, we're waiting the chief and uh, deputy, deputy chief uh, Zach Meyer is planning a trip up to uh, Ohio with the, with the vendor and they'll need to get that, uh, that accomplished and that will start the production of the fire truck. Um, so everything's moving along well. It's just a process that, that has to be, has to be done and it's, and as Joel knows, we've been reporting that the fire trucks do take a lengthy amount of time, uh, but we'll get that trip out of the way and get the get the date uh, get that date started where they, it's in fabrication. Um, with that, uh, staff vehicles uh, for for the chief, we had two that have been delivered and have been invoiced. Invoices came in and paid. Uh, they were the two uh, F-250s. One of the I think one of the trucks are being equipped. Uh, with some needed uh, equipment and but they're both basically in service now uh, and the chief can I'm sure put those to much needed use. And lastly with the fire and EMS this is a, the only project that we have currently ongoing uh, with uh, with fire and that's fire station 11 if you remember this is um, this is pretty much a site work project uh, we're improving the access in and uh, coming in and, and entering uh, State Route 92, and uh, it's enlarging the uh, the parking lot in the back, adding some additional parking spaces, some lighting back there. Uh, we're replacing the sewer system as as we've been reporting the past couple of months. Um, just to kind of give you an update on that, uh, so the decision was made. Um, to move forward with with utilizing WSA sewer system for that area, it was it was the most feasible thing to do. And on the agenda today is another uh, request for a change order from the design team. There there will, would be some additional survey work that they will need to do on 92 for the sewer for the sewer line, um, and also a, some uh, some design work. So that's on the again on the uh, on the agenda for approval. Once we get that done, um, he's ready to move forward to, obviously this is gonna require an access permit from GDOT. So he's got put a set of plans together for them to review. And, uh, but we're we're in good shape. He's, the, the plans are already well underway. It's just a matter of getting this, this additional work done uh, and getting it submitted to GDOT. They, as you all know, have a, a, a rather lengthy review process, but hopefully I'm, I'm hoping that we can get this completed and and be ready to bid this project out um, towards the end of the year. That will put us in the in the winter months, but uh, I guess we'll assess that as we once we get the design completed. Um, but everything's moving along with the project, and at this point, with no issues. So that wraps up fire, um, and I'll move into transportation. So the the resurfacing program is going along uh, as scheduled, no issues. Uh, they have completed 11 roads uh, out of the 34 roads that was in their contract. And when I say completed, uh, you know, there's two separate operations going on. That's Baldwin Paving doing the um, milling and, and, and patching and the Douglas County Maintenance Forces are doing the, uh, the overlay. So 11 of those roads are completely done. That's, uh, that's including the resurfacing. Uh, some there are some more roads done with just the patching and and, and milling 
uh, but 11 are completed. Two of those roads, the John West and, and Stuart Mill Road, which are were badly needed um, projects. Um, just a shot there, uh, Stuart Mill Road. Uh, the, the day I was out there, just been the last week or so, they were actually doing the uh, the striping on it. So uh, nice looking road, a uh, road that was badly needed, obviously. Uh, one of the main corridors in the county. Um, so I'm sure the, the citizens will enjoy that over what uh, what they were having to drive on. I have an additional slide here. It's not a resurfacing slide. Uh, it is, this is on uh, Alexander Parkway. It's, it's one of the LMIG striping um, roads. And I just want to emphasize this. I don't do it uh, much with uh, with projects that are that I, I don't have on a slide presentation, but this is mostly the most of the funds coming from the, uh, the LMIG grant here. We do, we are matching it with SPLOS funds, but this is one of GDOT's most popular programs. It's, uh, it can only be used for striping uh, and it's just, uh, it's, it's economical and it's a good, um, it's a good improvement to the roadway. This road obviously has not been resurfaced. It had been, it had faded quite a bit and I'm sure the striping that was there had, had been faded quite a bit. Um, and Miguel has done a good job of taking advantage of, of funds when he can get them for this. Um, so it, this leads to the high school, obviously, if you don't know that. Um, but it's a good program, and I would just highly recommend the county continue to take advantage of it um, when we when we can. Uh, moving on to our first intersection project, Stewart Mill Road at Reynolds Road. Uh, as I've been reporting, we are still in the, the, uh, the right-of-way phase here. Uh, Miguel is hoping to get this completed uh, by the end of the year and hopefully get it uh, to get it bid out uh, the first of the year. I know we really want to get this one done. It's just it, it is just a process with the right of way, as you know, uh, but we're down to those two parcels uh, that Miguel's working on. One of them is with the city, but I, they're, they're moving forward. Uh, so no, no major issues that he sees uh, at this point. So hopefully we'll be getting this project uh, within the next few months uh, under construction and get a bit out and under construction. Bright Star Road at John West Road, you know, this, this one was recently let to construction, so we're in the construction phase. We had some re uh, utility relocations that we had to get worked out, uh, so they haven't really got uh, started uh, good yet, but they have mobilized and I'm sure we'll be doing as much work in the fall here as they can. Uh, Sweetwater Church and Doris Road. This was this one's been under construction for a bit here, but they are on schedule. They did have I think Miguel's given them a little bit of a time extension due to some um, uh, some utility relocations also. But I was out there last week. Uh, they have got some asphalt down finally, and um, which is a good time with weather dry like it is. Uh, as you can see, that it still looks pretty like it's fully under construction, but they're making progress with it. They've got. Um, um, They've got some asphalt down where the new lanes are going to be on, on both Doris and, and Sweetwater there. So uh, steadily coming along, and they should be able to get this project completed, hopefully uh, hopefully by the end of the year. Uh, it depending, you know, obviously that's going to depend on, on weather, and it may roll into uh, early spring, um, depending again on, on the weather. Uh, Chapel Hill Road um, is moving along. Uh, SEI, the design team, has submitted uh, uh, a new, an updated concept layout to Miguel uh, at the end of last week for the entire corridor, and that's what we've been waiting on. Uh, so we've got uh, Miguel have an opportunity to review it now. It's got the basic layout of um, what we, what's going to be a 14-foot two-way turn lane with two 12-foot travel lanes in each direction. So uh, the design team is uh, asking Miguel to do that get to make sure he, they don't have any changes in it. And then uh, once they get that back, any comments back from Miguel, they will move forward with with uh, some additional survey work that's gonna be needed uh, to finish out that and then and then move into the final design phase for the project. And as you remember, this will be a fairly lengthy right of way um, phase on this project, uh, which probably get into well into 2021, uh, but hopefully it won't, uh, won't be any any difficult parcels, but always best just anticipate that. Uh, but as soon as uh, we can get Miguel into that phase, the better off uh, let him get started with the right of way. Highway 5 at Douglas Boulevard is moving along. Uh, 
with the design phase. They're working through the, the, all the, the complicated issues that are out there with right of way, uh, the developer on the corner, and with the utilities. Uh, but no big issues at this point. Uh, Gail's report that they're, they're moving. They just, it's just taking a process, working through the, there's a lot in that, uh, it's a small project, but there's a lot of stuff there in that, as, as everybody knows in that corner that they've got to, um, they've got to get checked out in order to get to a final final um, design phase and get the right of way in the Miguel's hands to start that process also. So hopefully uh, we'll have um, we'll have this project, uh, it'll be into the spring of 2021 for construction. Uh, again, that's gonna depend on, on, on how well, how quickly the utility relocations move and also the right of way. But we'll, I'll keep, keep you updated as we move through that process. Um, the post road bridge over Dog River, no change there. Uh, GDOT, other than GDOT's contractor, is still uh, uh, scheduled to be in here. We were told October. Uh, we'll, hopefully, we'll be able to confirm that over the next few weeks to make sure he is on schedule to come in and, and get that uh, much needed bridge underway. All right, and then getting into some of our sidewalk projects. This is one at Lithia Springs Elementary School. Uh, the project's moving along quite well. Uh, you know, it's, it took us a while to get here, but once you get a contractor, it's not, you know, the, the work itself is um, not empty in time. They've got a, they've got sidewalk, a good bit of sidewalk already done on turning here. And then uh, we still have Miller Street to do up, going up back up towards South Sweetwater. Um, but much needed sidewalk and with the, with, with some, some luck here with the weather, they should be finishing that uh, within the next few weeks, next couple months, um, and wrap it up. And same with Chestnut Log uh, Middle School. Uh, everything's moving along. Again, we got some uh, sidewalk in there. Uh, the one on the right there is right in front of the Chestnut Log um, Middle School. And then the other with the jog there is going up towards uh, State Route 92. Uh, we'll extend all the way up to 92 and picking up a couple of those side uh, subdivisions on each side of the road. So good news there. Everything's going well there. We are working through some issues with some utility conflicts, but nothing major um, as we work through the projects. Uh, and then New Manchester High School. We did get um, the design team did get the, uh, uh, we finally got the, the speed reduction uh, completed, as you well know. Uh, and the uh, design team has submitted those revised plans first to Miguel for review, uh, but it should be fairly quickly, and we got to get it back to GDOT um, as a second uh, uh, revised set of plans for them to review. We still need that encroachment permit approved. Um, hopefully, this will, this will go through without any, um, any re revised comments from GDOT, but uh, we'll keep you posted with that. But once, this, once we get this uh, encroachment permit completed, uh, the plan should go here fairly quick and there's no right away phase for it, which just, it'll accelerate that much more. So with some luck, uh, we might can get this project uh, underway and get it completed by the end of the year. Uh, our culvert on, at Whitestone, um, as you recall, we, we had to go through the, the uh, design revision that did give us a reduction in the cost. We also had a little bit of an issue with a wing wall and some right of way that was needed. Um, and I'm saying that uh, I was hoping the contractor would be back in there by now, but uh, Miguel and them are expecting them any day um, for them to remobilize. They've got some equipment in there and ready to go, uh, but we needed to get the uh, that little issue with the wing wall um, first. Uh, and again, we're hoping they can get this project started and get it mostly done or substantially done by the end of the year. It may roll into 2021, but um, first we got to get him mobilized out there and get him back to work full time. Um, our street light projects at various locations uh, in the county and also on I-20 at the inter interchanges. Um, and I mentioned this last month, that it's boiling down to materials at this point. Uh, on the interchanges uh, in Greystone, who has the majority of the, inter the uh, locations, um, the, the poles on the interchanges are specialized poles that they're waiting to get in. Uh, they did have the, a, a large shipment of the street light arms that came in. 
um, but they were they had some problems with them and they had to send them back but they're expecting those any day now uh, but we're monitoring that very closely Simon Road is finished we do have one that's finished and they're moving to Bright Star Road next um, but they've got to get these these light arms in to, to start hitting a lot of these small these small projects so we'll set back uh, to some extent with the uh, with the materials but uh, we'll stay we'll stay in touch close um, closely monitor those and keep you keep you updated with that and George Power has that one interchange uh, that they're waiting I've had not gotten any updates from them but that's back in GDOT's hands to uh, for some final comments on that one interchange highway 92 at Riverside Parkway um, this is the project that we're, the county's following, basically following GDOT's lead on it. It'll be something similar to State Route 92 at Mount Vernon, where GDOT's going to use what they refer to as a quick re quick response program, uh, and we'll hopefully take the lead and and uh, and build this project. Uh, we'll know, I guess, as we get closer to that, as what as far as the level of the county's responsibility for it. Uh, but at this point, no no updates from GDOT. They were last month. They was still trying to get the funding for it approved uh, through their upper upper management. But good news, obviously, uh, if it turns into a, a state right now to Mount Vernon uh, from the county's viewpoint. Our Lee Road widening project, um, the, uh, the due date for the bids was extended to the 17th. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, Miguel's reporting that we've got some sounds like at least five contractors that are very interested in it and, and hopefully we'll get some good competitive bids for this project. I'm looking forward to getting that that one underway, certainly for we get into um, get into winter. And finally in transportation, our Maxim Road uh, sidewalk project that ties it in up to uh, Cobb County. Uh, the plans are, are mostly complete. They still have some work on them, but we do have that one uh, parcel that Miguel's staff's going to have to acquire at the gas station. Uh, so that's going to slow it down a bit. But uh, again, this project will go pretty quick once we get it. Uh, we get that parcel acquired and, and Miguel's able to get it bid out. Um, if, with any luck, we may can have this completed uh, by the end of the year, certainly as we go into the first part of, uh, of 2021 with some with some weather some good weather and with that uh, we'll I'll wrap it up with some project updates in parks and rec uh, our tennis courts are nearing completion I'm glad to report um, the only thing remaining is the uh, landscaping so again, I, I kudos to uh, the design team, Carter Watkins and the contractor integrated. Uh, they uh, again have put together a, a very nice project. Uh, this would be a great asset for the county and the parks program. Uh, they just did the parking lot last week. That was a, one of the main things left. Tennis courts are basically done. Uh, we'll have to do, do a light test on Musco's lighting, um, which that won't be any hold up in the project, but uh, uh, like like I reported that the landscaping is the only thing left and a little bit of grading so a good project um, you know we were concerned at first with the budget on this with the, uh, the amount of rock that we were having to excavate but it's everything has worked out uh, well with that we came in on the budget on what uh, what we had reported so good news there and hopefully they'll be playing some tennis on that um, uh, certainly uh, uh, going in towards uh, the end of the end of the fall so Good news there. Our multi-purpose rec center is well into the construction phase. All the slabs are poured. Uh, we've got block coming in, which was, which was the uh, the next key factor in this project and getting some walls going up. Uh, it was a little slow, slow getting started and getting the, the manufacturer of the block to get the right block out there and get the get the approval of the architect. Um, so we're, we're there now and the block is arriving and, and should start seeing some walls go up here soon. So no uh no critical issues here other than this uh, um getting uh, getting the the, uh, the walls going up and um, again i'm hoping to get this project dried in by the end of the year uh once we can going into the uh, into the winter will obviously help them out greatly uh and being able to continue work um 
through the winter months, as, as you well know, with the rainy uh, winter we've had last year. Um, the senior center, uh, again, is, is, is starting to wrap up. Uh, we've been reporting this. It uh, will be mostly complete uh, by the end of October. Uh, we may stretch into November a little bit, but um, they're doing the final touches on it. They did the, the, the parking lot is completed now. Um, and it's just a matter of finishing up the, the painting and the flooring really inside. Uh, so we're, we're really looking forward to this and getting everything finalized with it um, with, uh, with Headley. They, again, have done a good job of keeping this project on schedule and, and turning, it, turning it over to the county as, as, they, uh, as, as we had scheduled. So next month will be, uh, uh, I'm sure will be some, uh, will be a good update uh, as the report and when we can actually expect the keys to be turned over. Uh, to the county. And and finally, with the wrap up parks, uh, Bill Art and and Fair Play, we're working with Greystone to get the, the power hooked up to the buildings. Uh, he's completing uh, drying in with windows being set and getting the roofs on it. So I've uh, slowed down a little bit here uh, with the buildings. Septic tanks, we did get, um, get approval from uh, the health department. Um, on a design criteria, so we're moving forward with getting those designed and and getting those in also. So we'll I'll keep continuing to keep you updated with the progress of those, but we're getting getting near the, uh, the completion on those also. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, that completes my uh, report for September. I will. Um, Take okay, any questions you. from the board. Let me get back on. Okay, thank you. And also, and also uh, is Director um, Good with good. you today, David Good? Uh, David is online, yes. David, do you have uh, anything to add? And then I'll certainly uh, I'll yield to the Board of Commissioners for questions. Well, really, I'm just um, here to say that I'm glad to see how the revenue has come in this, uh, this these last three months. I know there was a concern with everything going on with the COVID-19. So that's really the main thing. Um, I've gone around the county um, looking at this uh, multi-purpose center, the senior center, and seeing how the new 50th Spring Senior Center is coming along. So I believe the citizens will not only be happy with what we're doing in Parks and Rec, but everything that's going on now that we're getting all these streets, the intersections um, getting ready to be uh, going to construction and then with everything that's going on in fire and knowing that we have finally turned over the radio system and came in under budget and that is serving at the capacity that uh, that they were instructed to have. So really, I'm just glad to see how that worked, but I do get a chance to talk to the citizens virtually anytime that we can speak to the citizens. That's exactly what we do. And thank you to the Board of Commissioners, you Madam Chair, for really pushing this SPLOS project through making sure that we have all the support we need. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Mr. Good. Board of Commissioners, do you have any questions for Mr. Gable or Mr. Good at this time? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't see you, Commissioner Robinson. <laughs> Just one quick question. How much money do we have left over in PAYGO? Commissioner, let me, uh, that's a good question. Let me, uh, if I, I will need to look back at, uh, at, at the spreadsheets and I'll get you that number. Okay. And PAYGO money? Correct. Right. Hey, this is Jennifer. I can tell you the PAYGO money. Thank you. <clears throat> the uh, PAYGO that we have currently is around 19.5 million and those funds have been programmed into the SPLOST already. Okay that was my next question. So how much bonding capacity do we have at the end of this? Have we programmed 100 percent? Yes we have. Okay. okay. Third question, what about the city? How are they doing? They have used all of their bond proceeds. I believe it was last month was their last draw on the bond part. Um, and then I don't know how much money they uh, have remaining for their pay go. I can just tell you that what they've received 
um, for the PACO is around 7.6, 7.7 million. Uh, But because we do not handle that account, I don't know how many withdrawals they've had from their PACO. Last question, Miguel. Is Miguel here, Madam Chair? Um, I believe he is. Um, Director Valentin, there you are. Yes, I'm here. Why did we pause um, on the Lee Road bid? Why did we extend it for one week? Um, there was an issue reported um, getting all of the plan sheets to display correctly. And so we had to go back and provide a couple of sheets that were not clear. And so that we needed to give them a little more time to go through those and uh, put together their bid. All right. I yield for now, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. If there are no other questions from the board, we're going to move on. Thank you so much, Mr. Gable, for the presentation. And thank you so much, uh, um, David Good. We appreciate you. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. We're going to move you, on. Okay, you're welcome. We're going to move on to tab number seven, which is under public hearing uh, to consider amending the Douglas County Code of Ordinance to adjust the package mm-hmm. detail Sunday alcohol sales of malt be- beverages and wine to begin at 11 a.m. and end at 12 uh, midnight, pursuant to the House Bill 87, which went into law on August 3rd, 2020. Uh, Manager Ron Roberts. Oh, good morning, Madam Chair, uh, commissioners, and citizens. Uh, actually, Madam Chair, I noticed this morning and I emailed Lisa is actually House Bill 879 that was passed August 3rd, uh, 2020, and um, it uh, the changes that uh, we are able to make and other counties and other municipalities are able to make are to the Sunday sales of beer and wine, as you so mentioned. So this would affect Section 3-46 of our uh, Code of Ordinances. Um, we would be um, moving the sale of beer and wine uh, back to uh, 11 a.m. to midnight on Sundays. And we would need to have a public hearing, uh, as, as the agenda says, tomorrow for this item. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ron. Board of Commissioners, any questions regarding this public hearing? Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Roberts. We're going to move on to tab number eight, authorization to amend the budget to reflect part-time furloughs in the amount of 6% in the remaining budget on the attached part-time general ledger account uh, finance. And then also the general fund total is $54,116.24. Fire and EMS total is $7,048.55. And solid waste fund total is $967.07. Jennifer Holman, our director of finance. Uh, good morning, board. This is actually Sabrina. I'm going to present these this time. Yes. Jennifer's playing catch up after being out. Um, so this is just the way we're, the reason we're doing part-time budget and we're amending it is our part-time people, they just get a specific amount set in their salary. So if we were to furlough them, they could just put another part-time person in that position. So um, in working with Frederick and Mark, we just said there's five out of five divided by 85, which is the working days left in the year, that's right at 6%. So we were just reducing all of the line items that are part-time by that amount. And I do want to mention that this does include everyone, including constitutional officers. I know Frederick has been in contact with everyone, um, but it does not include any boards like the Board of Assessors, Board of Equalization, or Planning and Zoning Board, as well as um, poll workers, but everyone else who had a part-time line item, they did receive a 6% reduction in this amendment if the board passes it as a way to do a furlough for part-time employees. Is there any questions? Board of Commissioners, do you have any questions for Sabrina, our Deputy of Finance? Uh, Commissioner Guider, I see you hanging yes. that up. Mm-hmm. Okay, Sabrina, uh, on the fire and EMS, you're saying they have part-time employees and we're they were hired to fill in vacancies uh, that we had in the fire and EMS uh, budget. So uh, we're cutting those 6% also? Yes, ma'am. It included every department was the way that we had, um, you know, Frederick and Mark and everybody had discussed it. 
Well, uh, since our last meeting, <clears throat> there was talk about the um, CARES Act actually funding first responders. So if we're being if we're being able to collect the payroll for fire and EMS, and I assume the sheriff's office, do we not need to relook at the um, first responders uh, being furloughed since we're being reimbursed by the CARES Act? And, and that would be something the board could decide on. It's whatever you all choose. So this is just an amendment, you know, in the meetings during the uh, mid-year retreat and during the um, millage rate setting when we decided the five furloughs, and this just seemed like the most fair way. But obviously the board has within your rights to decide and change anything, and I can update this amendment to whatever departments you all want to see reflected. I'm just saying that um, it was brought to light at our last meeting that the CARES Act will actually reimburse counties for all first responders. So that being the case, we might need to rethink the furloughs of first responders because we're getting paid to work them. Does that make sense? Um, and of course, we it was necessary when we did not know we could do that because of uh, the budget uh, uh, shortfall. But do we not want to rethink this as far as the uh, first responders because of the CARES Act reimbursing us for their salaries? And I'd like to hear from the other commissioners uh, on this since this has been brought to light in the past two weeks. All right, thank you, I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Guider. Any other comments from the board, commissioners, regarding this statement from Commissioner Guider? Okay, we don't have any comments. Uh, Commissioner, so what we'll do is uh, certainly uh, you, I, I encourage you to reach out to each uh, commissioner, district commissioner, and, and have a conversation if that is of interest to you at this time. Um, and with that being said, I'm going to move on to the next item. Madam Chair, yes, uh, may I ask that this be uh, a separate vote tomorrow? Yes. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to move on to uh, Lisa Clark. Did you get that? Make sure that this is a separate item and it, it will yes, be. Commissioner. It's, it's a business. Like, yeah. All right. Authorization tab number nine authorization to amend the budget to reflect the adopted millage rate of 12.563 in the amount of $9,580.99. Um, is this Sabrina again or Jennifer? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so again, since we had adopted a millage rate of 12.563, um, we originally had adopted a budget with a millage rate of 10.213 with a collection rate of 96%, and that was about 47.2 million. With this new millage rate and reducing the collection rate down to 93%, that would be tax revenue about 56.8 million. So this would just be amending the budget to reflect the difference and upping the revenue by the nine point almost six million dollars. Okay. Any questions from the board? All right. Thank you. And we'll move on to tab number 10, authorization to accept the funds from the State Court Technology Fund in the amount of $2,488.92 for three laptops for the Solicitor General's office staff. Uh, Sabrina, that's you again. Yes, ma'am. And the next one is actually identical. It's just a separate check we received. As you all know, we have a special revenue fund. That's our State uh, Court Technology Fund. And it's only allowed to be spent on certain items such as you know, new technology and with COVID, they've been using it to buy laptops so people can work more remote and webcams. And that's all that is. And the judge just gives a court order. We receive a check and once the board votes on it and gives us the okay to accept it, we'll amend their budget so they can make these purchases. Okay, any questions from the board? We're going to move on to tab number 11, authorization to accept funds from the state court funds in the amount of $224.58 for three webcams for the solicitor's office staff. Um, Deputy Director Sabrina Cogborn. Yes, ma'am. This is just the exact same thing. They just cut one check for the laptops and then a separate check for the webcams, and they're both out of the 
state court technology fund and we received a court order and we will just amend their budget once the board or if the board votes to um, accept it. Okay, thank you so much. Any questions from the board or concerns? Okay, we're gonna move on to tab number um, 12, authorization. Thank you so much, Deputy Director. Uh, we're gonna move on to tab number 12, authorization to approve the 2021 Douglas County Employee Benefit Offerings as recommended by the Benefits uh, Committee and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Perry, Rick. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and to the Board of Commissioners. Uh, we do have a recommendation that is coming from the Benefits Committee. Uh, I have uh, MSI along uh, with me this morning to go over a short uh, PowerPoint presentation to just inform the commissioners of what those changes would look like. Uh, that information has also been emailed to you all as well so uh, that you can review this before tomorrow's meeting. Matt, good morning. Hey, good morning. How are you? Very good, I hope you all are doing well. Good, and if you all could give me just one second to queue up my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Let me see here. All right. And I will share this screen here. Matt, you ready? Can you can everyone see my screen? Yes. Good. And Matt, if you would take it from here. Uh, I certainly will. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Matt Fidwell with MSI. And um, we wanted to show you the financial impact of the decisions made by the Benefit Committee earlier uh, uh, last week. Uh, on the medical plan, we are looking at an approximate decrease of about 1.45%, going from 16 million to 269,000 down to just at 16 million, 32,000. Uh, the Medicare Advantage, which is the coverage for our retirees who are Medicare eligible, there's approximately 160 of these retirees. We uh, are recommending a, a change on that that will reduce the cost from 823,000 down to 672,000, which is about an 18.4% drop. On our dental and vision, we are uh, these are self-insured by the county, and we are uh, projecting just trend increases on the claims, and that's why you see the increase on the dental from 684,000 to 716, and on the vision from 112,000 to 115,000. There is no change on our long-term disability that's offered to the employees, and the basic life insurance is the changes recommended there. We're going to expect to see a drop of about $20,000 from 152 down to 132,000 for the life insurance for the upcoming year. We did not uh, uh, make any recommendations to change the employee or the retiree's cost of the insurance. And so the overall net impact to the county would be taking the total net spend from 15 million, 129,000 to just add 14 million, 757,000 or an annual change of approximately 372,000 uh, less than what was spent in 2020. Commissioner Geiger, raise her hand. Sure. There's a question. Any questions from the board? Board of Commissioners. Okay. Frederick, Thank you. Frederick, could you go to the next slide, please? The changes on the employee benefits, we've tried to outline them here. And uh, the first change is that 
physical therapy, occupational therapy, and chiropractic uh, treatment. We're going to change it from the specialist copay down to the primary care copay, which will go from a 60 to $30 uh, per visit, and then increase the amount of eligible visits from 20 to 30. And the feeling behind this, this is going to be, we feel, a cost neutral change, but the process behind this is making sure that people are able to get the therapy they need uh, in a timely fashion and so it's affordable to hold off having more costly surgeries and treatments from people not being able to get their physical therapy and occupational therapy done. Under item number two, we're, we're including behavioral health at no cost to the Live Health Online, which is a telemedicine uh, service. Currently, anybody receiving behavioral health visits, it's a $30 copay. And again, the reason behind this is what's happened, particularly in light of the environment we're in today, is that more and more people have been uh, a lot of stress from the uh, uh, change in the environment in terms of the lockdown. There's been a lot of people being treated for anxiety, depression. And so we feel that by making these behavioral visits available through Live Health Online, it's going to be better for the member in the sense that rather than trying to deal with this through taking more expensive drugs and they to be able to get the therapy they need at a, at a, at a, at a, at a trade-off at no cost versus trying to take drugs that are more expensive. So again, we see this as a, as a uh, no co net cost to the health plan. The third item is that we're asking uh, to make virtual sleep studies available through Live Health Online. Um, this is a basically adding Live Health Online as a vendor for doing the virtual sleep studies. It, it is a, uh, this way an employee or a family member could actually do the sleep study in the comfort of their own home, and it would be at a lesser billed charge to the county. And it would be something that's uh, a little bit more, uh, uh, I guess, friendly to the member who's actually having the sleep study rather than having to go somewhere and have the sleep study done. The fourth item is a, is a uh, we're recommending adding a new specialty drug accumulator feature. And this has to deal with uh, a lot of the manufacturers out there provide coupons to their employees. And, and these coupons uh, that they apply to the employees literally pay the bulk of the employees copay and charges for those specialty drugs. And what this new specialty drug accumulator feature would do is it would take this into account so that if an employee is actually getting the prescription drug at a reduced cost, then that would actually reflect on their maximum out of pocket. And so uh, uh, this is something we, we feel uh, needs to be added to the plan. And then the, the fifth item is we're requesting that we change the HMO to an open access plan. And again, this is the, the, the decision on this is being made really to make it easier for people to get into the HMO plan without affecting the cost. The sixth item is we're re recommending changing the flexible spending account administration to ActWise. This is a, uh, a vendor that is actually part of the Anthem Blue Cross network. And that this way, when a member logs on to their Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield website, they'll actually be able to see information on their FSA and it reduces the amount of documentation needed by Anthem in the event of a claim. So it's, it's the same cost to the county administratively, but it just makes it easier for the member in terms of uh, the administration and following their FSA uh, plan. And then the last item is uh, a permanent life insurance policy through Trustmark that has long-term care coverage available is going to be offered as a voluntary option to the employees. And so those are the changes for the employees. Uh, I don't know if we want to take questions now or move on to the to the to the slide. But are we okay going on with the next we can slide? Move on, Matt. Yeah, just move on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then slide four. These are the changes to the retiree benefits that are being recommended. The benefit changes on the Medicare Advantage plan, which covers the retirees who are Medicare eligible. And again, this is, I believe the exact number is about 161 retirees are covered under this plan with uh, spouses. Is changing the co-insurance from 100% to 90%. 
and then adding a maximum out-of-pocket limit of $1,000 for all claims throughout the course of the year. So this means that those individuals who are covered under the Medicare Advantage would no longer uh, 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 have coverage at 100%. It would go to where the plan would cover 90% of it. But once any one retiree reaches $1,000 in expenses for the course of the year, the Medicare Advantage plan would pay 100% of the coverage. And then the, the second change is the retiree life insurance is recommended that it be amended to reduce the de benefit to 50% at age 75 and another 25% or a total of 75% at age 75. The minimum death benefit would never go below 15,000 on any retiree. So those are the changes recommended on the retiree plan. And then on the last slide, we have the open enrollment schedule, which uh, we have September 29th is the deadline for the benefits to be approved by the BOC. And then we would be out uh, providing information to the employees week of the October 12th and uh, be available to see the employees later in the month that we would have open enrollment closed by Friday, November the 13th. And that would ensure that all employees would be able to have all ID cards and information in their hands prior to January 1. And so that's a summation of what we're doing, and I'll turn it back over to you, uh, uh, Director Perry. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, we are available for any questions. And again, I state that this information has been sent to uh, to all of the commissioners and uh, as, Mark, uh, as well as Mark. This is the recommendation that's coming from the Benefits Committee, and we think that it is uh, uh, a, a good plan moving forward uh, for uh, 2021. And if you all have any questions, we'll be glad to respond today or tomorrow. Okay. Uh, Fred, if you could, for the Board of Commissioners, if you could explain the one or regarding the death benefits for our retirees. You said uh, it really would, it's a duplication of efforts because we already have something on the front end as well and also so our retirees will understand. So you can you explain or, or have uh, Matt go back to that particular slide, whatever you want to do. Okay, let me go back to that particular slide. And I believe, Madam Chair, you're referring to the um, yes, the life insurance here. Yes. So, so explain that to them. You said we have uh, really it was a duplication of efforts because we already have something for our retirees. So, really, it was just an added. It was just really too much. It was it was top right. heavy. So, you, if you could explain it to them so they could understand. Yeah, and, I, and I'll, I'll call on uh, Matt in just a moment, but we do have a duplication of effort, uh, efforts here. Actually, with our retirement plan, we do have a pre and a post uh, uh, death benefit for our retirees. So that will work in conjunction with the life insurance plan. And Matt, if you could go over, you provided for us during our benefits uh, uh, meeting a um, uh, a, a you, you looked into the future as far as what our life insurance costs would be and uh, the savings we would uh, we would yield as a result of putting uh, this reduction factor in place. Could you talk about that? I'd be happy to. Currently today, we have almost uh, $5 million worth of life insurance on approximately 150 retirees. And it is projected that of the employees that are left to retire under this benefit, that they're going to add almost another $10 million worth of death benefit to that to that plan uh, over the course if nothing's done to amend the program. And if we look at just the retirees who are currently on coverage today, and we freeze the amount that's out there, uh, assuming that nobody's added to it, and assuming that no one uh, passes away, by putting in this reduction schedule, we're able to bring that amount of life insurance over a 10-year period down from 4.8 million to about 3.2 million. And it puts us in a, in a position to where this life insurance from a long-term basis would be affordable to future boards. Today, right now, if we were, the county was to sit there and say, I want to get out of the retiree life insurance. What would happen if we went to an insurance company and, and just tried to turn over the current uh, the current liability? We got a proposal from MetLife, and just on your based upon your your current retirees, 
they told us that if they we wanted to get out of the retiree life business, that they would pick up and cover our current retirees, and it would cost us over the next 10 years approximately $4 million. And that, that is the cause that death benefit, uh, it, it's someone who retires is eligible for 50% of their salary up to a maximum of 75,000. And when you start looking at the actual expenditure on it, uh, when you start going out 10, 15, 20 years, the amount of life insurance, which could reach as much as 15 million, will actually get transferred into real premiums over the course of the, of the lifetime of these retirees. And so from, from a, an expenditure standpoint, just in simple math, by putting this change in today, we're going to save over the next 10 years, just on our current retirees, with nobody else retiring, over $150,000. And we set the plan up to where it, we feel it will be affordable for future boards to afford. Currently today, uh, we, we've probably only got about a third of the number of retirees on board in terms of who are eligible to retire. And by putting this change in, I think we're, we're putting this plan in a, in a position one where it'll be affordable long term. And number two, we still are offering a minimum death benefit of 15,000, which is substantial uh, in terms of what we see in the retiree benefit realm. Yeah. yeah. And, and Matt, I also like to again remind uh, the Board of Commissioners that we do have, in addition to uh, this, uh, the life insurance that we provide for our retirees, a death benefit uh, that is inclusive of our retirement plan. And I believe it's, and I'll have the exact amounts for you uh, on tomorrow 15000 for those who are currently retired and $50,000 uh, for pre-retirement uh, uh, death benefit that for those who are vested in the plan and pass away prior to uh, prior to being able to retire, uh, there is a death benefit for their listed uh, uh, beneficiaries. So we wanted to reduce uh, the, the redundancies that we have in our uh, benefits plan that's actually costing us money. And uh, this was one of the areas where we, um, we decided to move with. So uh, we'll be, we're eligible or we're here to answer any questions uh, if the Board of Commissioners has any. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Director Perry. Um, any questions from the board? Okay. Thank you so much for the presentation and uh, Board of Commissioners uh, look forward to this presentation coming before us tomorrow so we can vote accordingly. All right, we're going to move on to tab number three. Uh, 13, uh, authorization to approve change order number one for fire station number 11, Dallas Highway sewer project in the amount of $4,060 upon recommendation of the fire and EMS committee and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents pending final legal review. Chief Scott Spencer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good, good morning, chairman and board of commissioners. Uh, we actually, uh, since our fire and EMS committee meeting, uh, have an amended number that we want to present this morning. Uh, we found out that we are not going to have to have an, uh, an off-site drainage easement plan. So the, uh, the new number is going to be $3,660. So that's a reduction uh, of about $400. This will allow the uh, the company, as uh, Mr. Gable said earlier in his presentation, uh, to finish doing the design work, uh, and then we should be able to uh, get ready to start building the driveway and, and sewer system. Okay. Any questions for Chief? Or all right. Thank you, Chief going to move on to the next item, which is yours as well. Tab number 14, authorization to award the bid for the purchase of an ambulance to Custom Works in the amount of $323,699 to be funded through the 2016 SPLOST funds as recommended by the Fire and, EM and EMS Committee and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents uh, pending final legal review. Chief Spencer. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh as uh, Mr. Gable alluded to earlier, uh, Custom Works 
was our pick. They they best met our specifications we put out. They also happened to be the low bid uh, and had all the equipment that we required on it. Uh, so for the bid of uh, $223,699, the uh, Fire and EMS Committee recommends that we go with custom body works for this new ambulance. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Chief. Any questions from the board? Uh, Madam Chair, this is Mark. Um, we just need to, uh, Lisa, if you would please revise that number. It's 223 instead of 323. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got that. Okay. So it's uh, 232 or 33,000. Uh, it is. Later. Okay. Just want to make sure. Yeah. 223699. Two, Two two three. That's that's much better. <laughs> yes, so you saved saved what a uh, hundred thousand yeah. dollars right there. How about that? We had a few numbers <laughs> transposed this morning. That's a good tra transposition. I love it. All, All right, right. Um, Commissioner Carpenter, I see you up. Are you? You you got one one of the items that I, I was like, wait a minute, I'm not looking at that right. I know what we said because I was in, in the. Uh, but at at any rate, Chief Chief Spencer. Can you tell us, is this to replace in, an ambulance or is this um, to put into, um, as a new one, to put into our um, our um, resources? Uh, th this will be a replacement ambulance. Uh, so one of the ones that's in service now will go to reserve status. And then one of our reserve status will go into surplus, so. Wonderful, okay. We uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I certainly appreciate our fire and EMS committee and the uh, the commissioners that serve on that, uh, Commissioner Carthen, Commissioner Guider. Uh, I just appreciate what y'all do to help us uh, get this stuff moved along. We, we, we appreciate what you all do. And I know um, for um, ambulance, EMT, paramedics, we, we do have a shortage, but we are working hard, as is every county, I think, to, to make up for those. Am I correct? Yes, ma'am. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. So um, I just want to say thank you and thank you to those who are working more than 40 hours to ensure that the citizens here in Douglas County are being taken care of when those calls come through the E911 system. Um, so yes, with that, Madam Chair, I yield. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see you, Commissioner Guider, but I just have one question for Chief. Chief, how old are those ambulances? The ones, the number one, you said one is going to I guess it'll be put in the reserve status and then the other sounds like it's going to be auction off. How old are those ambulances? Uh, I'll have to get you the exact year numbers, Madam Chair. Uh, we do put a lot of miles on ambulances, mm -hmm. uh, especially, uh, you know, when we have to go downtown for, for certain trauma cases and all. Uh, mm -hmm. But I can have those to you by tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Guider, I see your hand. Yes, uh, I just want to segue uh, on... Uh, what uh, Commissioner Carthen said about um, serving with Scott Spencer. He will be retiring November 1st. Is that right, Scott? Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, as the current uh, chairman of the Fire and EMS Committee, I want to just say it's been a pleasure working with you, and I think we've made a lot of progress uh, in the past year or so. And I wish you the best of luck and thank you for your service to this county. With well, that, I yield. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. You so thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. Thank you so much, Chief. And I echo certainly Commissioner Guider. I'm just not quite ready to say goodbye or let you go. You know how I feel about this. It's bittersweet, so I'll we'll chat later. But you know, I'm I certainly certainly want to extend publicly my appreciation for everything you do. Thank you, Chief. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're going to move on. If there's nothing else, we're going to move on to tab number 15, authorization to renew the security system maintenance agreement with NCI Cabling and Infrastructures Incorporation for the Annex Building uh, located at 6200 Fairburn Road in the amount of $8,561 and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents pending final legal review and uh, county administrator. I believe this is one that we had, we take, we took off the agenda last uh last week or last couple of weeks. Yes, ma'am. And I talked search. I talked to Benny. His microphone's not working. Um so NCI, this is an agreement for in the amount of eight thousand five hundred and sixty one dollars 
um, to maintain the security system and all the electric door locks at the, the Douglas County Government Annex building, which houses tax and tag GIS and appraisal. Um, this is a one year renewal. We've already had them on board for a year. Um, talked with Russ Martin. There's no need for the technology committee to review this. This is a renewal. Um, and this is the same company that maintains the security system at the courthouse. Now we have another one that does the door locks at the courthouse, but um, so at the Douglas County Government Annex, this would be for maintaining the security system and the door locks. Okay. Any questions from the board? Uh, Commissioner Guider, I see your hand. Commissioner Guider. I would like for the minutes to be um, revised to say network cabling infrastructure instead of NCIS. So if someone's looking for uh, the corporation, they will be able to find it more readily. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I've talked to Lisa. I've talked to Lisa, and we're going to make that change. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. If there are no quest questions, we're going to move on. I want to, before we uh, certainly have, we have a discussion item, but I want to pivot back to uh, tab number eight. Certainly, Board of Commissioners, I want to remind uh, not only our Board of Commissioners, but our staff and everyone that uh, this year, which uh, I don't know if it was leap year or what it was, but anyway, every 10 years in the county, we pay an extra payroll to our to our staff. Uh, this year, the employees will be getting, instead of 26 pay periods, they have 27 pay periods. That costs the county an additional $2.1 million just for that extra pay period. There's no other government in uh, Douglas County that's on that schedule. It, it simply failed because of the way we pay our staff you get paid on Thursday. So I just wanted to just reiterate that. I know there's been a lot of dialogue, but our staff, are re they're receiving an additional pay period this year. And certainly uh, I echo my uh, financial analysts uh, and also the uh, that sat with us during our um, budget hearings recently really hadn't done a thing. They said, Chairman, you have not done one thing because you're getting an additional pay period. That's why I want to make sure we don't dismiss that pay period. Certainly not going to try to sway your opinion one way or the other, but I just wanted to bring that to light. All right, uh, we're going to move on to tab number 18. Tab number 18 is uh, certainly a discussion item, and it's a proposed annexation by the city of Douglasville for property tax at the tax parcels 015600. 1500480156001049 also 0156001500050 and finally 0156001500051 Riverside Parkway and King Drive uh manager Roberts Ron Roberts, are you here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I lost my internet for whatever reason, so I had to call in. I think Phil's also on the line. I was going to share the share a, a, a map of the, the, the location. It's actually 6.762 acres. Uh, they're going to be rezoning from RA to OI, and uh, in, it's going to be in the city for a senior uh, assisted living facility that they're wanting to build down there. Um, and um, so, you know, just as part of what we do when we're just bringing these annexations forward for, for as discussion items. And again, I'm sorry, I'm still trying to get back on this thing, but um, uh, the only thing that, uh, that, that we, we as staff talked about and Phil kind of saw this when the, when the plans came in is there's some stuff that's going to, that we'll need to do on the development review side. Um, just because of its location and proximity to um, the, uh, um, the access to the backside of Palmer Falls subdivision to King Drive. But uh, we have, some, you know, we got any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ron. Board of Commissioners, any questions for Ron Roberts regarding this annexation? Okay. Thank you so much, Ron. We're going to move on and then we have last. Yeah. Beg your pardon? I heard someone. Thank you. No, it was me. Thank you. Okay. Okay, you're welcome. And we're going to move on to tab number 19, which is TAD discussion. And certainly it's not a name by this uh, TAD discussion. Uh, County Administrator, can you lead this off? I'm not sure.
where are we going with this tab discussion? And then Yes, ma'am. So um, um, Commissioner Robinson, we had discussed with uh, him and Chris Pumphrey about the uh, the TAD discussion, uh, which is TAD's on the ballot for November 2020. 2020. Um, so I have, uh, I'm not sure if Chris, uh, Commissioner Robinson wants to leave this off. I do have Chris Pumphrey and Sarah on the line as well. That was all Chris. Okay, Chris, you ready? Yes, can everybody hear me? Oops, can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. We can yes. hear you. All right. Uh, good morning. Yes, um, we've, um, as you all have voted to put the uh, tax allocation district on the uh, ballot in November, um, the primary focus uh, of that ballot or, or putting that TAD together um, was to move forward a critical corridor for development. Um, this has been something that's on the books for for years on years. Um, I remember first hearing about it being discussed as the Southern Inner Arc, um, which really was the connection of all four districts via um, a route that basically goes from Highway 78 and Sweetwater Road uh, all the way down through Lee Road, uh, connecting through Bomar, um, Central Church Road, and over to Bright Star Road. So it's really kind of that that key corridor, and really launching um, that with the Lee Road extension. Um, so as you all know, we're doing the widening of Lee Road um, from from I-20 all the way down to Fairburn Road, which is very important. Um, we uh, hired Clark Patterson Lee a few years ago to do a small area study. Uh, to focus on a large property, which is the master plan that you all had adopted uh, a little over a year ago now um, at Lee Road in Fairburn Road. And then also the, um, the land use study that covered that entire corridor. And so the focus really was to leverage all of the tools possible to attract private investment um, down that particular corridor. And one of the tools um, that could be used is the uh, tool of a tax allocation district. Um, so we've gotten the, the powers from the legislator, legislature to go to uh, the voters for a referendum, um, which will be this upcoming November. Uh, this is something that was just recently done by the city of Douglasville uh, to move forward the uh, downtown master plan and the redevelopment along uh, uh, Highway 92. So that um, TAD is in place today. And uh, to move things forward, there needs to be a lot of education uh, for the public. So uh, the thought behind it was, you know, whereas the, um, the, the local government, you know, is not in a position to advocate, um, but is definitely in a position to educate about what a TAD really is. And so we think this is a perfect opportunity to move forward on something like that, um, to educate the public about a TAD, let them you know, answer all the questions or a lot of the preconceived notions about what a tax allocation district is. And so that's really what this discussion is about. Um, and then I know we had, you all had brought on Dentons to kind of help bring on that, the legislative component of that. And I think it'd be a good, a good decision to move forward with them as well. Uh, on the education, and they are also um, uh, tuned in on the call, Steve Labovitz uh, and Caesar Mitchell. Any questions? Any questions from, from the board? Any questions or comments? Commissioner Carthen, I see your photograph. Thank okay. you, Chief Jones. Uh, Mr. Pumphrey, uh, can you give us a little bit more information just for the um, for the benefit of myself and those who are kind of new to to ta tax allocation district? You mm -hmm. said that there is one in the city of Douglasville. How is that going and what, and what how is that benefiting them? Yeah, so the, the TAD, um, I'm trying to get my dates right. <laughs> um, I think it just went into effect earlier this year. Um, so it was voted on in 18, spent the entirety of 2019. Um, setting the boundaries for the TAD um, and all of the, the policies. I know you all as commissioners had to sign off on some things uh, during that period of time as well. So it officially went into effect uh, this year, uh, January of this year. 
And basically it is used um, as a tool for um, basically horizontal infrastructure um, to support private sector development. So it's a means of looking at uh, future um, tax revenue to come from a private sector development, a bond against that that then allows to do the horizontal infrastructure that might be sewer infrastructure for a site or, or what have you. Um, and so we are primarily focusing um, on the downtown area. However, it's available for all of Fairburn Road. And we're right now issuing RFP for a master developer uh, should go out by the end of this month. And it's utilizing the TAD district as a tool for the developers as they evaluate the redevelopment of the city green in downtown Douglasville. Okay. So it's the beautification, but it's also like a public-private partnership. We incentivize those who are looking to do or to come in and bring businesses, maybe even housing, something along those lines, so yep. that we can right, we can incentivize them yep. to come out to Douglas County to do their building because they're going to do it anyway. Is that, yeah. Well, and, and Steve, and I think I just heard Steve um, Steve's voice, but Steve, you can uh, elaborate even further on that. Thank you. Okay, uh, you know, a TAD, I'm sorry, I, I can't see y'all, but a, basically a TAD is a, uh, a, an economic incentive tool so that you can attract people or developers to come to areas that may be difficult to bring development. It will help them with infrastructure. A TAD can be utilized for many different uh, uh, items that developers might need in order to make a project work. I think um, most jurisdictions have utilized uh, TADs. There have been a number throughout, uh, you know, Atlanta has, uh, has utilized them uh, on many different projects. You probably are familiar with all of their downtown has all been in a TAD. The Atlantic Station project was assisted by utilizing a TAD. Uh, Union City has just utilized uh, putting together a TAD. Many, many jurisdictions uh, have used this uh, as an incentive tool. I think what you're, what's coming up is, uh, is that I think why we're discussing is, is that you uh, have, uh, uh, the legislature has giving you the right to have a tab. The question is going to be, will your voters approve this for uh, unincorporated Douglas County? The city passed it, and, the, and once the city passed it, it had to obtain the counties and the school board's consent to the utilization of its increment. Uh, once, if you're uh, if on in November your voters approve the use of the redevelopment powers uh, law, which would permit uh, 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 the tax uh, allocation district to be utilized, then you also, in order to make this as beneficial as possible, would need to have the school system agree to be part of the task. Once you have it, it can be used for many, many different things. But until the voters vote in November, you don't have the ability to utilize it. So what this is and what we're talking about now is you as a community can educate, educate only because you are public uh, officials. You cannot advocate for a TAD and for this vote. I think what, uh, what, what we're trying to do right now is to, is to, to assist, I mean, the chamber and trying to get the message. We are going, Denton's, because we have done so many TADs around the state of Georgia, and we are uh, we have done these kind of and assisted with referendums in the past. So this referendum is coming up. The officials can't can't uh, advocate. They can only educate. The chamber, uh, Sarah Ray, we've spoken to, can educate, and we are. I mean, uh, can't advocate, and we are going to be uh, if. if 
uh, approved, we are going to be assisting them on trying to get the message out, which needs to and hopefully will lead to the passage of this uh, referendum in November. Karen, I, I hope that's so clear. It is. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I yield, Madam Chair. Much, uh, Commissioner Carthen. I just had one, if I could, just uh, uh, our legislative, uh, should I say, our extern director of external affairs uh, director. Certainly, she was very instrumental in, in getting this tab moved forward down with the legislative legislation. Right. And if Tiffany Stewart Stanley could just chime in a little bit and just kind of give us a little history as well, and then we'll pivot back to you, Commissioner Guy. I know you have a question. Um, is Tiffany Stewart Stanley on the line? Morning, Chairman Jones. Yes, um, well, I'm just excited to see that the county is moving forward with the TAD. This was passed back during the 2019 uh, legislative session. Um, and it's, you know, it's always good to make sure that the citizens are educated about what a TAD is, but also having that advocacy piece is going to be very instrumental in helping to get the uh, TAD passed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Commissioner Guider, I believe you had a question. Thank you so much, Tiffany Stewart Stanley, our Director of External Affairs. Commissioner Guider? Yes, ma'am. And this is just uh, kind of a question or clarification as to so the public will know what a TAD is it's tax anticipated district. Um, I believe, and please correct me, Chris, if I'm wrong, um, let's see, the government backs the uh they allow uh, private developers to come in, but do does the government back the bonds? Uh, no, um, I'll let Steve go. I'll, I'll let Steve answer those. Okay, first of all, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a bond, but if in fact a bond would be issued, then the government does not back the bond. That's one of the real advantages of utilizing it. The government does not need to back the bond. Only the project stands for the back, the backs the bond, if in fact the bond is issued. But the way a TAD works is this. Basically, let me just give you an example. Uh, you have land that you're thinking about utilizing, and right now it's gener generating $100 in taxes. Basically, a TAD permits you to do that project, and when the project is completed, the, the taxes will go from $100 to $500, hypothetically. The additional money, the $500, to over the hundred, the county and the school board still gets their hundred dollars, but the increment, the increased amount, that can be utilized and given back to a developer either by financing a bond or by giving it back to the developer each year. The additional tax increment can be utilized for certain redevelopment parts of a project. Uh, so that's where a TAD, it is not a tax increase. You are just utilizing the tax increment, the increase in taxes that that project will generate to assist the developer with infrastructure. Okay. Um, what happens uh, in the meantime from the passage of the TAD until there is something to increase the the revenues from that district well it, so say uh the uh once a tad is passed and once you have a tad in place and once you have the area where the tad will be you create a special fund and the you work with your tax commissioner they create a special fund so if taxes increase during that period of time, even before a project is 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 put into place, that increase goes into the special fund. And then when the when the TAD is completed, and after if you use a TAD for 20 years or 25 years, and I'm going to give you an example, and this this is a very big example, but but you can see how this works. 
Atlantic Station, when it was first created, was generating $300,000 in taxes for the city, the county, and school board. The TAD was formed. That $300,000 every year continues to be paid to the city, the county, and the school board. However, now the taxes, because of all the projects that have been generated there, are producing about $15 million in taxes. Those monies go to pay off. There were bonds issued in the Atlantic Station, Tad. Those monies go to pay off the bonds. But in 2024, when the TAD has been completed, these additional taxes get sent back to the county, the school board, and to the city. So it's basically you creating a special fund for the tax do dollars. The county and the school board still get the amount of money they were getting before the tax allocation district was created. Once the once you have a development agreement in place and you're working with your developers and you work out how much they're going to get when the project is over, then all of the additional money from the taxes comes back to the county and the school board and a city if they're involved. Is that clear? Uh, yes, but uh, now I do remember there were some negative figures coming out of Atlantic Station to begin with. Well, uh, don't it was not the success that they thought it was going to be right off the it, bat. It, right, because in 2008, very good point, in 2008 and 2009, when the recession took place, if you recall the Great Recession, they didn't produce the taxes they were supposed to produce, so it, it did not it did not generate what it anticipated it would generate. So the TAD was extended. Uh, it had to be extended out a little bit so that the bonds can be paid. But it's still going to be a – once the bonds are paid, this is going to be a boom for the, the city, the county, and the school board. But it, it took a little longer than anticipated. They really believed – that the the because of how well it was doing initially, the bonds would be paid off much quicker. But it's taken a little longer because of that uh, particular situation. But the downtown Atlanta chat has been incredibly successful. Uh, pretty much, there has not been one bad tag created in the state of Georgia uh, that that uh, had any issues. As a matter of fact, the only tax increment financing in the country that has ever really not done well has been in Orange County, uh, California, and there were a number of reasons for that. So this is kind of like the field of dreams. You build it and they will come. And then the well, uh, no, this is <laughs> this instead of field of dreams, you 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 put this in place and then developers will come. Okay. Because developers That's will see the advantage of being able to, you know, many times, for instance, the uh, developer may not have the infrastructure that's necessary to build. So what this does is they build their project, but this helps them with water issues or, uh, uh, you know, sidewalks or parking or things that they need, which are worked out. You will have worked it out with any developer that comes we would assist you on putting together a development agreement so that you it would be in place and the developer would get a certain amount of money only if they meet certain criteria. And if they are doing that, then their taxes, their taxes, it's the taxes that they generate from their project instead of going to – uh, to you guys initially would go back to the developer to help with infrastructure. But at no time is the government held responsible for uh, you are, initial fall. You are absolutely correct. That is okay. one of the great advantages of a putting a tax allocation district in place. The government is not backing it. The only thing that's backing this project is the project itself. Okay. With that, I yield back, and I thank you for all the information.
It's okay. a pleasure, and if, if anybody would like us, we can certainly send out information uh, that we, we that we our firm has put out that you can read about it, and and we would be happy to send it to you so that you have that for your uh, for your reference. Thank you, um, thank thank you, um, and we appreciate the presentation, and thank you so much, Commissioner Guider. Uh, I did see a hand, Milton Kidd. I saw your hand. Did you have a comment yes. regarding yes. The subject matter? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I okay. had a comment. Uh -huh. uh, I've directed Kidd. What I'm getting, from what I'm getting, uh, you all are uh, essentially preparing to do some type of public education forum based off of the November 3rd election. I would advise uh, with any time frame for this public uh, information form to take into account that November 3rd is the actual last day. The large majority of Douglas County voters will vote early and by absentee, so they would have already cast their ballot before November 3rd. So be mindful with your dates as far as a public information campaign. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing that information with us. Thank you, Director King. I mean, and you know you you have a question on the ballot coming up in November. That is correct. And so what what we would try to help you do is to make certain that the public understands what it is because sometimes tax allocation district, you know, people think that's a tax increase and it is not. And it's very important that the citizens understand that. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Steve. All right. Thank you so much, Director Kidd, and I'm going to move on. Board of Commissioners, if there's no other comment. All right. This time, uh, Attorney Bernard, uh, are there any other comments from the Board of Commissioners before I call for an executive session? Attorney Bernard, is, or do we need to go into executive session? We do for uh, litigation, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you so much, Attorney Bernard. Uh, Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, the motion was uh, Commissioner Carthy second, Commissioner Robinson. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? We have a motion and a second. Please indicate would you, your response when I call your district. District 1, Commissioner? Yes. District 2, Commissioner? Yes. District 3, Commissioner? Yes. District 4 Commissioner? Yes. Chairman, yes. We have a 5 unanimous vote and the motion carries. All right, uh, Mark, you'll take it from here. You'll tell us what to do. Mark Teal, our County Administrator. Yes, ma'am. Um, if commissioners would, just keep your Microsoft Teams open um, and we'll call you right back in the uh, executive session meeting. And citizens, we will return momentarily. momentarily. Thank you. as a result of this um, deadly virus. So uh, I encourage, encourage all our citizens, please continue to stay safe uh, and do the right thing as we continue to monitor this uh, virus 
and uh, take precautions. With that being said, Board of Commissioners, if you if there's nothing else to come before this body, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.